Hello everyone. Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living Victoria Online. My name is Carrie Hunter and I'm the Senior Minister and Spiritual Director of the Center. It's lovely to have you here with me today. As I'm recording this, it is Sunday afternoon and our service has already ended um, at the Cook Street Village Activity Center. Um, so we have that behind us. And of course, if ever you'd like to join us in person, we would love to see you there. I know that some people do come after they've watched a few of these talks online. And, um, and it's great to see our congregation growing and thriving. My topic today is, and so we pray. Probably one of the most important things that we learn to do in this teaching of ours, um, Science of Mind teaching, which was created by Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder, which dates back to 1926 when he first started speaking to a group that very quickly grew to 3,000 people in Los Angeles. And he was a very, very popular uh, radio broadcaster as well. So if you ever like to look up Dr. Ernest Holmes, you'll find out a lot about him online. So today um, I was, was thinking about a movie that I saw many, many years ago. It was made in 1978. So that does go back away. I don't know whether you saw it or not. It's called The End, and it starred Burt Reynolds and Dom DeLuise. It was a very funny film, and I, I don't know if it's even possible to find it anywhere anymore, but uh, I, I remember at the time, the, the end of the movie was what really, really struck me the most and made me laugh the hardest, I think, because it just is so true to life. So the story is about a man who, played by, by Burt Reynolds, um, a man who has a diagnosis of a rare blood disease that gives him only a few months to live. And he is told that nothing can help him and that it's going to be a very painful death. Well, he's not into a very painful death. So he tries several times to commit suicide without success. And he has no compassion of any kind or no empathy from his family or friends or from his priest. No one really seems to care. He wasn't a very high character. And so as he's going through all of these various attempts, the family decides that he really needs help. So he is committed to a mental institution. And there he meets Dom DeLuise, who is a psychopath. And he engages the assistance of the Dom DeLuise character to help him end his life. And again, there are unsuccessful attempts. And one day, the Burt Reynolds character gets uh, a message from his doctor that in fact, it was a misdiagnosis. That diagnosis belonged to somebody else, not to him. And that he, uh, he in fact was alive and well and was going to live a long and happy life. Well, he was exuberant. And so he checked out of the institution. He rented a, a wonderful motor launch and was out at sea. And what he didn't know was that Dom DeLuise had followed him and was on the boat with him. And, and, and he was absolutely committed to ending Burt Reynolds' life, the characters that they're playing. And when Burt Reynolds saw this, he thought the only way out was to jump overboard and swim to shore. And swimming to shore was quite a feat. It was a long distance away. So he started out, and he's begging, he's saying, Please, God, please, you know, please save me. Now that I'm, I know that I'm not ill, please save me. I, you know, get me to shore. I promise I'll be a better person. I promise that I will be reformed. I have transformed my life. I will transform it. And, and, and I will give my all to do that. And so he's swimming forward and forward. And then he says, I promise that I will honor the Ten Commandments. And he says, um, I won't steal, I won't kill anybody, I won't commit adultery. He goes a few more strokes and then he says, God, I promise I'll learn the Ten Commandments. And then he's going a few more strokes and he's getting a little bit closer to the shore and, and he says, um, uh, you know, God, I'll tithe 25% of my income. I'll tithe 25% to my church. Nobody does that, but I'll do that if you'll just save me. 
and he keeps on going more and more strokes. He's getting a little bit closer, and as he gets closer, closer, he says, "Well, maybe fifteen percent," and then he gets closer still, and he says, "I think ten percent. That's sort of the norm." And then he reaches the shore and he says, ah, church has enough money. And it shows him running off down the beach with Dom DeLuise behind him, chasing him. End of the movie. And I remember laughing so hard when I saw it because I just thought, you know, well, it's an exaggeration. It is really um, <laughs> the way that we sometimes behave. You know, we're pleading with God, saying, you know, please just grant me this one thing, God, and I promise that I will reform. I promise that I will live a better life. I promise that I will do, you know, whatever it is. You know, we we feel compelled to do that kind of thing when we're in the worst of times, when we're really in the dark night of the soul or really in trouble or somebody that we love is in trouble. And what's really interesting is um, Dr. Holmes in his textbook says that the most frequently asked question of him uh, was, is spiritual mind treatment um, the same as prayer? Because this teaching of ours is really, really deeply immersed in prayer. And, uh, and Dr. Holmes always said, well, yes and no. He said, if you believe that prayer is begging, bartering, and beseeching from some external god, some old guy up there on a cloud, wearing a pink nightie and looking down on you and judging you, um, then no, uh, it's not the same thing. But if you believe that you're praying to an, an all-knowing, ever-present God, all-powerful God, and that it, it lives and has its being through you, then you are doing spiritual mind treatment. So people often get confused, and I tend to use the word prayer a lot, or affirmative prayer a lot, because people have a greater understanding of what that is if they haven't been part of our teaching. And the thing is that we know that this prayer works. In fact, prayer works according to the belief system of the person who is doing the praying. So the chances are pretty good if you're having a minister or a, a licensed practitioner praying for you that, uh, that you're going to have a, a, a deeper belief system. You know, no question, you know that God is there. You know that God is at work in, as, and through you. You know that it is this power that is doing the work. You know, it is not, it is, is not some external power that is doing it but it's whatever is flowing through that person. And it helps if the person receiving the prayer believes it too, but the person receiving the prayer does not have to. If the practitioner is strong in his or her faith, um, in his or her complete knowledge that, that this is true, that this works, then you don't have to worry because it works. And it's... It's something that each of us who has gone through this teaching really understands. To get a practici practitioner's license, first of all, one has to have three demonstrations. Some might call them miracles, um, but we call them demonstrations. Three demonstrations of prayers that work. In other words, they have to have testimonials from three people for whom they've prayed and who's, who, can, who can testify that this has worked. So... You know, a little bit of the uh, of of uh, the background in terms of what we do with prayer, and I w was recently um, looking at a video that was uh, part of a talk by Greg Braden, wonderful scientist, spiritual teacher, speaks all over the world, very very popular, and really deep. I love his books. I love I love what he does, and he talks about about prayer. And and again, Ernest Holmes talks about this, but Ernest Holmes teaches a specific kind of prayer. We typically call it five-step prayer. It could be seven steps, could be three steps, but there is a formula that we use. The thing is that those are all words, and when we are learning this from a textbook, we're in our heads 
learning it. We're intellectualizing things. And in a different book called Living the Science of Mind, Dr. Holmes spends a chapter talking about how important it is to feel what it is that we're doing. And he said that feeling is love. That is God. God is love. It is the love that we feel inside us as we are praying for another being and as we are knowing whatever the truth is for them. Anyway, Greg Braden talks about, about this. He, he talks about the heart. And he says the heart emits an electronic magnetic energy or frequency. And the thing is, it doesn't just go out a few inches. It's not like an aura that might go out a few inches or many inches, depending upon how big one's aura is. It goes on for miles. It can go across the earth. It is very, very powerful when it is that pure love coming from our hearts. And it's extraordinary to think about. I mean, there's been a lot written about this in recent years. Lynn McTaggart, um, I think it was in her book, The Field, although it might have been one of her other books, where she talks about uh, taking two molecules that are identical, that are part of the same thing, and keeping one in North America and sending one to another part of the world far away. And then she says the, the molecule in North America is manipulated. And as it is manipulated, that's that molecule that has been taken to the other side of the world is responding in exactly the same way as the molecule in North America. There is no separation. There is just what Einstein called the field. And it is this great field of connection that, that connects each one of us, one to the other, even though we can't see it, can't feel it, can't take it out to dinner. It is there. It is this energy field. And as we are praying, as we are emitting this love from our hearts, we're sending it out vast distances. And when we do it together, it is even more powerful. As Lynn said in, in one of her books, you know, there's an, uh, enough energy among three people to boil all the oceans of the world. Well, we don't know how to do that, and perhaps that's fortunate. But the fact is, it is powerful, powerful stuff. And Greg Braden goes on uh, to show a video. He's, he's shown it um, at the beginning of a lot of his workshops. And it's really worth noting here for, for anyone who really wants to understand the power of prayer. Um, this video is a video that is, is shot in a, a non-medicinal hospital in China, in Beijing. No medicine is used. There was no surgery used in that hospital. And there was an American woman who had a, a tumor that was three inches in diameter on her bladder. And the doctors in North America said it was inoperable. There was nothing they could do for her. She basically had a death sentence. But she wasn't going to stop with that. And she learned about this, this center in, in uh, Beijing. And she made an appointment. She went and what is shown on this video is, um, is as she's lying on what we would call an operating table in the operating room, but it isn't an operating room, it's a prayer room. She's lying on this table, and above her, there is a photograph on one side. It's actually a sonogram from, uh, uh, that was taken um, of the tumor that is, uh, is on her bladder. And you can see it's a large, large dark spot. And then the other side is live video running from an ultrasound as we are watching the tumor as the three, as three practitioners are praying over her. Now bear in mind this is in China. And so the three practitioners are, are basically using two words in prayer. And it, as Greg Braden says, it doesn't matter what words you use because it's what comes from the heart. That makes, that makes the difference. It's what is emanating from there. But these three practitioners who knew this power, and so they're standing alongside this woman who, who is wide awake, without anesthetic, without any kind of medication of any kind, and they're using, they're saying, wasa, 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 wasa. And, and as they're saying this, you see the tumor 
um, through, through the ultrasound, you see the tumor shrinking, getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And as it's getting smaller, they are getting more and more intense. It becomes wasa, 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 until it's all kind of running together. And then the tumor is gone. And then everybody applauds. And the woman is, is, is cancer free. Now, this wasn't an isolated experience or an isolated case. Before she arrived, they had done 188,000 of these. Think about that, 188,000 people healed from three practitioners. And, and the, the words wasa, it's W-A, new word S-A. The words wasa means already done. It's a loose translation, already done. In our teaching, we finish a prayer with very often with, it is done, and so it is. That's, that's our release from it. It's done, and so it is. The thing is, what we are taught is that we always see whatever it is that we want to see already done. You know, we don't, we don't pray saying, um, you know, one day before too long, um, Julia is going to be completely healthy. One day be, before too long, you know, maybe someday next week, um, Josephine is going to have that million dollars that she needs. Uh, George is going to have the great relationship that he's always been looking for. Someday it's coming. It's on its way. Um, you know, it's going to happen. Well, when we say it's going to happen, then we're always in the state of going to happen. We're always in the place of someday, because that's what we're praying. And what we're praying, the words we are using, are creating form. They're creating reality. So they're not creating a healed person. They're not creating the financial requirements for someone. What they're doing is just creating more of the same, the wanting, the needing, you know, the asking for, when in fact, we need to see it done. Wasa, already done. Wasa. And that's the teaching of Ernest Holmes in Science of Mind. We see it done, whatever it happens to be. And you know, using um, using the Ukraine as an example, for, because I know most of us have been praying for the Ukraine. How can we not? And we don't pray that peace will come to the Ukraine, because that still puts it off in the distance. What we pray is peace. The Ukraine has peace now. There is peace in the Ukraine now. There is peace in the Ukraine. Wasa, it is done, and so it is. And we hold that vision because it's called a mental equivalent. And we know that when we hold that vision and we, when we connect it with the passion in our hearts, that that is what is created. It's not something that we're longing for, that we're wanting to have. We may want it, but we have to see it done, whatever it is. If you want a new car, you have to see that new car in your life right now. It has to be there parked in your driveway or in your underground parking, wherever you park it, you would park your car. You have to be able to see it in your mind. You have to be able to touch it, to feel it, to smell that new car smell. And, and to know that it is done, already done. Wasa. It is done right here and right now. Not, and then not look out the window the next day and say, oh. It isn't there. It didn't happen. Because immediately upon doing that, it stops. It stops the process. And so we need to stay in that state of it being already done. You know, Greg Braden says that our emotions can change the world. And the thing is that whatever you are thinking right now is either changing the world, is changing your life, or not. Um, or if you're thinking that this stuff doesn't work, then whatever you've been experiencing that might not be so good, you're going to get more of. And so it's really, really important for us to get into our hearts to generate that love. 
And the best way to do that is to just close your eyes and sit and think about the divine pouring through you, divine love pouring through you, in you, as you, working through you, and whatever it takes to feel that love. It might be beautiful, beautiful music that stirs it up. And you feel it in your heart center, the middle of your chest. That's where you feel it. That's when you know that God is fully awakened and active in your life because you haven't shut it down. Instead, you've turned it on. Remember that song from Jonathan Livingston Seagull many years ago that Neil Diamond wrote and recorded, um, Turn On Your heart, heart Light? Well, that's what it is. It's Turn On Your Heart Light. And when we turn on our heart lights, then absolutely everything becomes possible to us. So it's something we have to remember. A hundred years ago, um, there was a group of scientists who did an experiment. They thought that there was some interconnectivity among all things, and they set out to try to prove it. And the thing is, they weren't able to do so. And it happened that at the same time, Dr. Ernest Holmes was teaching what, what we're talking about today, a hundred years ago. And Dr. Holmes was teaching something that is today proven that our thoughts create reality, our prayers create reality, and it is done according to what we believe, and it is proven by quantum physics today. Well, in 1986, the U.S. Navy decided to do this same kind of research, the same kind that was done 100 years ago by scientists, that to see whether or not there was a connectivity um, among all things with much more powerful equipment than scientists 100 years ago ever had. They were able to prove that, yes, indeed, there is this field that connects each of us, each one of us to the other. And there is this power that goes out, this, this electrical magnetic power that goes out from our hearts to all people. And it is a power that can heal us, and it is a power that can heal the world. I don't know why the U.S. Navy was doing this. I don't know what they ever did with the information. I'd really like to know that. And isn't it interesting that it was the U.S. I said it was the U.S. Navy. It was the U.S. Air Force. I would really like to know why, but perhaps some of them were having unusual experiences. I know I read that um, test pilots, uh, what, they would have that moment when they would black out um, when they were going at, at supersonic speeds. And, and when they would come back, when they would land again, they would say their lives had changed, that basically they had seen the face of God, or they had experienced God in that process. And there were special patches that were made for their uniforms that had a lightning bolt going through them. So if you should see someone in the service, in the Air Force, with a lightning bolt patch, it means that he or she has been to the other side, has felt the presence of God has experienced the presence of God. Um, and Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut who uh, went to the moon and back, um, when he was returning, he had that moment where he saw everything, absolutely everything, as the same. He just saw all of these particles that were all the same. His hands, his body, the spacecraft, looking out the window, the stars, and he said, we're all made out of stardust. We're all made out of the same thing because he could see everything at that level. And he went on to found the Institute for Doetic Sciences, which has been doing experiments like these for years and years and years. And Lynn McTaggart now has that, um, uh, has that um, entity since Edgar Mitchell's death. So... There's evidence now that proves these things. And possibly never before has the world as a whole lacked faith as much as it does now at a time when it is proven that it works. And the thing is, what Dr. Holmes writes about prayer and what Greg Braden said as well is, is that just asking the prayer in our hearts begins the process. You know, before we can even formulate the words, our hearts know what it is that we desire 
and that begins begins the process and as long as we don't shut it off by saying oh it can never happen not for me that's for for somebody else that's shutting it off but if we don't shut it off if we have this image of what we want our lives to look like of who we want in our lives you know of, of what we want to accomplish if we have the vision of the completed process perfect health the wonderful relationship you know, financial well-being, absolute well-being in all of our, in every part of our lives. You know, that book that you want to write, it's not just you want to write it because then you'll be left wanting to write it. It's you write it. I write it now. My book is published now. Beginning, that begins the process. And you don't shut it down along the way. As the saying goes, when you're out in the garden you don't, and, and you see the, the green appearing um, that is going to become a carrot, you don't pull it up out of the ground to look at it to see if it's growing or not. You leave it in the ground to a certain point when you know that it's ready to pull it up, when you know that it's fully mature. And it's the same thing with prayer. You know when it's fully mature. And you go to that place of knowing as, you know, wasa, already done already done. I know this to be true. Whatever it is that you're longing for in your life, you know it. Absolutely know it. Live in that power. Live in that knowing. And it all comes true. And that's the way that it really is. I don't know about you, but I was immersing myself in news about the Ukraine. And I still want to catch up on it every day. But for a week, I've been away. I went to Palm Springs for a week, which is why I wasn't online last week. And and I just kind of melted into the heat and the swimming pool in the back garden and, uh, and the, the wonderful air. It's absolutely a beautiful experience. And my mind emptied. And as my mind emptied, my heart filled more and more and more. And this is what we need to remember, not to be intellectualizing everything, but to get into that feeling nature into our hearts. And the night before I left, my heart was breaking and I was weeping as I watched the news. And a member of the, the legislature in the Ukraine, um, in the capital city of Kiev, uh, said that her sister had left for Hungary the day before. And she took with her her sister, the, the member of the legislature's daughter. She took her own daughter with her. She took the daughter of neighbors who had been killed. And on her way to the, the, to the train um, to get across the border so that she could get to Hungary, she found a little girl in the street sitting there beside her dead parents, a little girl not knowing what to do. Well, I was sobbing. I mean, I have wept more in the last six weeks during this war than I ever have in my life because my heart breaks for the people. My heart breaks for the atrocities being committed. And I realized as I was preparing for this talk that no, yes, I can be compassionate. Yes, I can have empathy with these people. But by God, this war is finished. Peace is in the Ukraine now. Wasa, wasa, wasa. I see peace in the Ukraine. I know peace is in the Ukraine. Wasa, wasa, wasa. It is done already. It is done. And so this is the way that we pray for the Ukraine. And we may not see this today and we may not see it tomorrow. But what is happening when we pray that way is that we are creating this. We're not on our hands and knees begging. We're not bartering. We're not beseeching. We are standing in the power of Almighty God, which is in, as, and through each of us. And it's so important that we understand this. With anything that we want in our lives... I mean, I just wanted to say just, I mean, I was saying, somebody, please stop it. Somebody, please stop this war. And then, of course, comes the realization we all have a part to play in this, each one of us. 
because what is happening over there, what molecule is tinkered with here, is tinkered with over there. What is happening here is happening there. What is happening there is happening here at some level inside us, if not anywhere else. And so we know the presence of God within. Peace in the Ukraine. Peace in me. Peace as me. What's up? Love in my world. Love everywhere expressing, awakening in every human being. It is done already. Wasa, wasa, it is done. And so it is. Abundance for all people everywhere. Wasa, wasa, it is done now. It is done in my heart. I feel the love for all humanity. It is done now. Wasa. Friendships, relationships that are healthy and happy and productive. Wasa. It is done already. It is done now. And so it is. And I realized as I was going through this process yesterday and preparing my talk for today that it's really all about prayer. And so we pray. We pray all day. It doesn't mean every moment of every day. But whenever we think of whatever it is that we wish to create in our lives, we see it done. If you're having trouble believing it, how many of you have read the book Eat, Pray, Love? You know, there's a, there's a section very early on. There's a page where... Um, I think it's the bottom of, of one, uh, bottom right of one page goes on into the, the top of the next page, where Elizabeth Gilbert, the, off, the author, is suffering through terrible depression and anger, and, and she's on her bathroom floor raging at God, or just raging, and then says, you know, I don't believe in you. I don't believe in anything. I don't believe in you. And then the voice goes through her body saying, so who are you talking to? And it was a transformational moment for her. Who are you talking to? She was reaching out to God. She said she didn't believe in God, but she was still seeking God. And God came to her and changed her life. And so it is not someone out there who's going to change your life if it needs changing for the better. It is you. It is God in us and through you because you are spirit having a human experience. You are God in expression. You are the way that God expresses itself on this planet or one of the ways. Each one of us is a different way of expressing. But we are all part of God. And so in the weeks ahead, let us remember Go to that place, go to that vision in our minds and connect it with the love in our hearts and the joy that we feel when we see this experienced and know that it is done. Wasa, wasa, wasa. It is already done. It is done now. And so it is. And so we pray. Thank you for being with me today. I love sharing this information with you. If you want to join us in person, again, we're at 380 Cook Street in Victoria. We have a meditation service at 1030 and at 11 o'clock our celebration service. And we would love to welcome you in person and have you join us for refreshments afterward. Bless you all. Thank you for being here. If you like what you've heard today and you'd care to make a donation to our center, we welcome that because that's what keeps our doors open. And also we are a tithing center and we share our income with, with other um, charities locally and abroad. And so if you would care to make a donation, you can do that by going to our website, www.cslvictoria.org. Or you can make a donation. Um, by, uh, by sending one by e-transfer, which is simply donate at cslvictoria.org.
On our website, the Donate button will take you to PayPal. If you don't have a PayPal account, just look at the fine print underneath where it allows you to use a credit card or a debit card and follow the instructions there. We are grateful for everything that you give. We're grateful for who you be, you know, for the, the wonderful expressions of God, for the prayers that you are giving out. And we invite you every morning at 8.30 to hold peace in the Ukraine, in your heart and in your mind. And do that for a few minutes of meditation. Just pray peace, not pray for peace. Pray peace. See peace. Know peace. Wassan. And so it is. Thank you again for being here and have a blessed week and a wonderful, wonderful spring. <laughs>